he always behaved outside the Oval Office. But I think it's totally in line with something he would do, considering he's been, you know, not not terribly vocal, but far more vocal than George W. Bush was about defending his record, his view for, of the world after leaving office. And him, he definitely saw Justin Trudeau as a protege of sorts when he uh, came into office in 2015. So I totally see it in line with what he wants to do, and he definitely sees Trudeau as brethren. So it seems totally responsible that this is someone who's articulating or pushing forward the vision of you know the world that or of liberalism that I agree with. So of course I'm going to champion him, even though I'm outside of office. Right. Mar, what do you think? Because uh, this is the, well, let's put it this way, the relationship between Canada and the United States is uh, deep and complicated, and I think uh, circumstances matter. And if this were, for example, George W. Bush endorsing Andrew Scheer or, in the past, Stephen Harper, it might be perceived in a different way. So how do you think Canadians will react to this? I think that Canadians will probably react <coughs> largely along partisan lines. I mean, any time you get some sort of foreign endorsement for the leader that you support, you're going to say, oh, it's, it's not that big of a deal, it's fine. You know, any time it happens on the other side, you're going to say, well, this is completely unnecessary and this is inappropriate and this is going too far. So I think that's largely the breakdown that we'll see in terms of the response to this tweet. I guess I think in general it's... I guess I think that foreign leaders generally should probably stay out of this kind of thing. I don't think it necessarily helps uh, the, the campaign here. Um, on the other hand, I think we're probably not likely to see a huge impact from this in the last few days of the campaign. I think this is probably not going to be the, the deciding factor for a really large number of Canadians. Yeah, I think it is fair to ask whether it's appropriate because obviously uh, Barack Obama uh, probably doesn't pay a lot of, uh, of attention to domestic Canadian politics. He, he phrased it in the context of Justin Trudeau being a world leader and a progressive leader internationally and that we need more of those leaders is how he put it. But Sherelle, uh, this is a domestic decision that's being made by Canadian voters and presumably as much as I'm sure you'd love to think that Barack Obama reads the Hill Times uh, website or iPolitics uh, he probably doesn't pay that much attention to Canadian politics so some people may feel it's a little presumptuous for him to opine about it I mean you could yeah I could see how you'd have that view but um, I don't also don't uh, regard Barack Obama as somebody who is um, who is not a deliberate person um, he doesn't do really do things off the cuff. He's known for being an overthinker. So I feel like he he knows exactly what's going on up here right now. I wouldn't be surprised, and he's and he's done this with the full knowledge of what's going on. Presumably, though, he did it with the full knowledge of the Liberal Party before he did it, right? Because you you would whether it arose from him, the Prime uh, Justin Trudeau, the Liberal leader, wouldn't answer questions today about whether uh, he requested it or his party requested it. But uh, you would think Barack Obama would not do it without at least giving a heads up to Justin Trudeau's team, right? Yeah, well, I think to Cheryl's point, this is definitely something that uh, someone like Barack Obama would give you, uh, you know, a heads up about that. Hey, I'm about to go public with this. Uh, here's here's what I'm going to do. So I, I don't know if it was necessarily some talk of collaboration or, um, you know, to use Trump's word, collusion. But I definitely think that, um, yeah, he definitely would have alerted the Liberal Party that I'm going to go forward with this. And, you know, just to circle back to Moore's point, I do think that the Liberals and the NDP voters and the Greens would be very, very excited if Donald Trump endorsed Andrew Scheer. I think that would be something right. that would go over well with their voters. <laughs> yeah. Maura, uh, as I said, Justin Trudeau, didn't answer the question when he was asked a couple of times today, did you or your team request it? I think a lot of people assume that that means yes, they did, because if they didn't request it and Obama did it of his own volition, then they, he would simply say, no, we didn't request it, right? I think that's probably a fair hypothesis. I mean, we don't know for sure, but I mean, you know, it seems like a pretty smart political move to make. If you're the Trudeau campaign, you're neck and neck with the Conservatives throughout this campaign. At the moment, you are at a real risk of not getting the largest number of seats um, in this election, uh, let alone a majority government. I mean, this is a point where you're pulling out all the stops. I mean, this would make sense as a political tactic to reach out to someone who you know is popular in Canada um, mm -hmm. and, you know, just ask, why not? I mean, I, I think that's, that's a smart move. And, um, you know, at this point, what is there to lose for the Liberals? They need to do everything they can at this point to, to try and, and get the largest number of seats on Monday. Yeah, and I think it was deliberately targeting progressive voters, obviously. It's uh, not pro targeting conservative voters. It's probably targeting the votes that the Liberals have lost to the NDP and maybe to the Green Party 
since the last election because uh, he did use that word progressive and it's it's actually a message that's consistent, Marco, with what Justin Trudeau himself has been saying over the last few days, right? I, I definitely think that it goes, uh, per, <coughs> perhaps, um, you know, we're, over, we're reading too much into a tweet, but I do think it helps build up, you know, Justin Trudeau's reputation, not only as someone who is, you, you know, a, a world statesman or someone who makes Canada look good on the world stage, but also as a uniquely singular, whatever you want to say, progressive voice in the world. And when you kind of build up those uh, you, know, you know those attributes, and you start, you know, and you have someone as eminent as you know the former president, who's very popular here, like Maura mentioned, talking that up. And I think that really, really looks good to voters who are perhaps a bit wary of what the Liberals have done in the past four years, yeah. who are flocking to the NDP and the Greens. More popular, uh, probably, than Justin Trudeau, oh, Andrew Scheer, so. or any other Canadian political leader right now. Uh, Sherelle, do you think it'll work? Will it make any difference? Will it bring any votes back? I don't know if I'd go so far as to say it will make a big difference. Um, like. It's hard to, has already been said, you know, people's minds are fairly made up. We did see a lot of people who've already voted in the advanced polls. Um, it Might it hit some of those people who are kind of a little teetering on the fence? Possibly. But um, I don't know if it will do enough to, to get where they need to get to. All right, let's talk about some other news arising from the campaign today. Andrew Scheer, the Conservative leader, has done a number of interviews today. And... Uh, Mora, he is saying that the party with the most seats in a minority situation, uh, he used the term, has the right to try to govern. Uh, that's actually not the case. Uh, then he used the term modern convention would have it that the, uh, the party with the most seats would have the first opportunity to govern. But again, that's not exactly how the rules go. I know that it's not just about the rules, it's also about uh, perceptions and there are there are, you know there are differences between a situation where a party falls three seats short of a majority or where a party gets one more seat or two more seats than than uh, the other party that's in contention to form a government those are two different scenarios who gets the most popular vote that might be a factor as well so there are a lot of gray areas here but it's not as simple as he's portraying it is it no, and you know Andrew Scheer is in a position now where he's looking at the possibility of forming a minor, uh, of, of winning the most seats on Monday, um, but he is unlikely to win a majority government. Although he is continuing to put that pitch out to Canadians, saying you need to elect a Conservative majority if you want to avoid a Liberal NDP coalition. Uh, so he's going to go hard on that message. But the reality is he is unlikely to form a majority government on Monday. But he could very well have the largest number of seats. But the problem Andrew Scheer is facing. Is is who is going to support him if he does have the largest number of seats. Um, the NDP under Jagmeet Singh have said very clearly they will not support a Conservative government. Um, and on some pretty key issues for the Conservatives on climate change and carbon pricing and so forth, um, pretty much every other major party is opposed to the Conservatives. So he's got a problem there if he's going to form a government, uh, a minority government. So he's saying that if we win the most seats, we should be able to form government and the other parties should sort of fall into line and support us. I mean, the reality is there's a very good possibility that um, whatever happens on Monday, that Justin Trudeau and the Liberal Party will go ahead and try to form government um, <clears throat> with support from the NDP, the Greens, we'll see how things play out. Um, so it's perhaps a bit of wishful thinking on Andrew Scheer's part, um, but he is in a bit of a in a bit of a tight spot in the sense that he needs to identify some some allies here. Yeah, and that's the interesting thing is that the polls show a very close race, and we'll talk more about that in a minute. Uh, but uh, and so in that sense, the outcome of this election is very unclear. But in another respect, it appears as though. It's, it, there's a very likely scenario that Justin Trudeau will still be prime minister, Marco, because there doesn't appear to be a path to power for Andrew Scheer, even if he wins the most seats, unless he wins a majority, and that doesn't look very likely right now. I, I think that that's, firstly, that's totally accurate, um, but I think that the, even beyond the numbers, there's this growing perception that Canadian voters are rejecting Andrew Scheer or are very lukewarm to him. So if you think you were trying to build this argument that you know, if you look at the numbers and the Conservatives are ahead of the Liberals, they won't be firstly by a very wide margin in terms of the seat total. It doesn't look that way, at least. I should, um, recent polling doesn't paint that picture. But if we do have a case where we're talking a few seats difference and Andrew Scheer thinks he is afforded or should have the right of first refusal to form a government, I think a lot of people would argue that based on these polls, based on how, you know, you, the party has actually lost support the past couple of months, the Liberals have kind of dived too, 
really sheer doesn't have a really strong argument to make that Canadians have elected him <coughs> to office, and I know we don't really do that here, but I, d I think it's really tough for him to say that I have the momentum, I have the support, or at least people have rejected the Trudeau government so much that I am the person who should step in line and take over. Yeah. Sherelle, what do you think? I mean, the having the right to form government, obviously we know in the Westminster system that's just not how it works. Um, having I think what Andrew Scheer is trying to do is paint Justin Trudeau as somebody who is going to hold on to power at all costs. And, you know, maybe that makes him uh, arrogant or narcissistic or whatever it is, that adjective that they're going to try to use to paint him as. And to put it out there to the people and say, I got the most seats, therefore I should be able to form government, but he won't let go and this is his problem, not mine. And I think that's probably the strategy behind this. I don't know if it's going to work, but I do believe that's the message that he's pushing right now. Maura, walk us through what happens in a minority parliament situation next week if, uh, if that's what we end up with. Well, th that's a big question. There's a lot of potential outcomes here, but uh, you know, I think that um, one very likely possibility is that regardless of whether the Liberals or the Conservatives win the most seats on Monday, um, that you could see Justin Trudeau uh, try to form a government. So one way he could do that is through a formal coalition. Uh, we haven't seen one of those in Canada since at the federal level since I think the 1920s or something. It's been a long time since we've seen an actual formal coalition which would involve another party having seats at the cabinet table, potentially the NDP. Um, but that is a possibility. The other, perhaps more likely scenario would be uh, Justin Trudeau trying to form a government with uh, some sort of agreement with the NDP, potentially other parties, um, that they will support the government on, conf on confidence votes and allow the Liberals to govern in, in a minority government um, as long as Liberals agree to certain conditions that the other parties set out. Um, so that's certainly one possibility. Um, if Justin Trudeau is not able to, uh, to win the confidence of other parties to move forward in that way, you could see a situation <coughs> where uh, the Governor General then allows the Conservatives under Andrew Scheer to try and form a government and win the confidence of the House of Commons. But really what this all comes down to is having the confidence of the House of Commons. So it depends what all those parliamentarians, who they decide that they can work with. And the first opportunity to do that goes to the current government. Right? That's, that's right. The, that's the convention. Mm -hmm. That's right. Now, just to have a little bit of fun with numbers, uh, the CBC's poll tracker, which I've been watching regularly, along with another poll tracker, 338.com, uh, 338canada.com. Uh, right now, Eric Grenier of the CBC has a seat projection where the Liberals win 131 seats, the Conservatives 129, the Bloc 38, the NDP 37, the Green Party 2, and the People's Party of Canada 1. And in that scenario, Marco, no two parties other than the Liberals and the Conservatives, who are obviously not going to work together, no two parties add up to the 170 votes required to pass a throne speech, pass a budget, and win other confidence motions. So that means that either the Liberals or the Conservatives would need the support potentially of two other parties, which makes it even more interesting, right? Well, I think it just goes back to the point you were mentioning earlier, and <clears throat> the most likely scenario is a Liberal government. If this is what happens and you need the support of two parties, well, who are the Conservatives going to... They're, they're, they would be div they'd be in tough finding one partner. Having two partners with, among those people, those parties with seats, would be next to impossible. So I think it all but suggests that the Liberals would form... would probably wouldn't form a coalition, probably just look for support on issue by issue or some sort of pact, perhaps, that the NDP or the Greens would support them but not really be part of the government. That's what I would see. In any case, I think that if that does happen, we probably won't see Parliament resume sitting or resumes actually, you know, getting to the hefty work of governing <laughs> and passing the uh, bills until probably the new year. Yeah, and the interesting thing about that is the, uh, you know, the it's the math is so tricky. It could shift based on one seat here or there, right? And and will there be an independent in parliament, or will the Green Party win three seats or four or five? Those kinds of things could end up mattering. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you could have you could have independence. You could have you know both Jody Wilson-Raybould and Jane Philpott in Parliament, and you know is that going to tip the scales? Is is somebody going to you know have to leave for a personal family issue and resign their seat? And then you know that could tip the scales. There's so many there's so many things that could happen here, which would make the situation sure. very volatile. Who becomes the Speaker of the House, mm -hmm. for example, right? Because that means one fewer seat in one caucus mm -hmm. at the end of. Uh, 
that process. 338 Canada, by the way, has a projection with the Liberals and the Conservatives each winning 132 seats, so finishing in a tie. The Bloc winning 35 or 36, the NDP 33, the Green Party 4. So, uh, again, very close all around. Um, but as you said, Marco, it, it feels like if a tie goes to the Liberals in a lot of ways, right? Absolutely. I, and I think for the Conservatives, it'd be really, really tough for them to make the argument that they should be the government or that, they, that they'll be able to work with these other two parties where they've kind of, like, I, I'm just thinking back to the McLean's debate, the first one and the first day of the, of the election call, or the second day, I forget. Um, they, everyone else seemed to kind of team up on Sheer, and it seemed really, really like a, a microcosm of what this campaign has been. You have these parties, these progressive parties trying to outflank Trudeau on the left, and then you have Andrew Scheer, who's on the way in the right wing, trying to win over voters, perhaps a bit wary of the People's Party leeching some votes from him. So I don't know who their partners are. It does seem like the Liberals would have a nat have natural partnerships with the NDP, the Greens, probably even the Bloc, considering their views about the environment and climate. So I, yeah, I just couldn't see an avenue where if that's what it breaks down, the Conservatives could be able to win the support of two different parties. Jagmeet Singh was asked today whether coalition is a dirty word. He said, no, it's not. Uh, it's interesting because, uh, Marco, you laid out some of the different scenarios. Um, I know that, uh, as you said earlier, Moro, it's been a long time since we've had a real formal coalition government at the federal level in this country. We've had them uh, provincially, of course, uh, and in, in the UK there have been some recently as well in the same system of parliament that we have. But uh, the coalition, uh, coalitions don't tend to favor the junior partner very much. Uh, they tend to pay a price. Uh, they tend to get none of the credit for the good stuff and all of the grief over the bad stuff that happens, and they often get punished in the next election. We've seen that in the UK. We've seen that provincially in Canada. So you wonder what kind of calculations uh, Jagmeet Singh and Elizabeth May will be making after this election about the structure of whatever we have going forward, whether it's a coalition or just a minority situation where the where some of those parties promise to support the the government on key issues. Yeah, I mean, you know, parties like the NDP are going to be looking for how to have the most influence in a minority government situation. And I mean, we've seen Jagmeet Singh over the weekend. Uh, you know, he made that comment about you know being open to a coalition with the liberals and then he sort of walked that back very quickly um, and you know now I think he's being a little bit more circumspect about it um, but uh, yeah I mean as I said before we've not seen a formal coalition in Canada for a long time I think that potentially some sort of uh, less formalized agreement might be the more likely outcome and if you look at the Bloc Québécois for instance they've said very clearly they will not enter into any formal coalition with any party they will support parties on a case-by-case issue-by-issue basis depending on what uh, is good for Quebec um, so you know they've taken a very clear position on that Jagmeet Singh and the NDP are obviously still sort of toying with different possibilities here um, but they're going to need to look at sort of how they get the most leverage particularly on the issues that he's really campaigned on on climate change on pharmacare for instance they're going to really be wanting to see some commitment to to uh, moving forward on those files all right let's see what our viewers think about Barack Obama's tweet and other issues that have arisen in the last little while on the campaign trail if you have a comment please give us a call right now or send us an email have your say at cpac.ca. Let's start with a call from Chris in London, Ontario. Hello, Chris. Uh, good afternoon, Mark, and Hi. to your panel as well. Um, in terms of the first question that you posed earlier um, about whether I think it's appropriate that President Obama injected himself to some degree by endorsing Trudeau, um, I'm of two minds on it although I come down mainly on the side that it perhaps was undesirable. I have always respected or admired uh, President Obama, and I'm a Canadian conservative, so it's not because of ideology. I just thought the man had integrity and character, and I still do. However, I do think it was treading in a dangerous area because the Americans have been so preoccupied themselves with foreign interference in their elections. I, I know the Russian issue isn't the same as this, but nonetheless, um, and as uh, I think it was Mora on your panel pointed out a little while ago, had, let's say, former President uh, George W. Bush 
done something similar, then the howls from the left side of the political spectrum would be deafening. Um, so the double standard issue comes into play. T- you know, I realize if it was a well-respected, um, right-leaning leader that Canada had strong ties to that endorsed Scheer, I'd, I'd probably be happy about it. So I'm not admitting, or I'm I'm not denying, I think it was the other lady, Sherelle, who said that someone's predisposition politically will influence how they view the appropriateness of this action. So that I, yeah. I'm admitting bias on my sure. own part. But Such as politics, right? There are lots of issues on which... Uh you know, if if your party does it, you think it's a great thing. If the other party did it, you'd criticize it. I, I'm not saying you, but that does happen a lot right. in partisan politics. Figuratively speaking, yeah. yeah. And, and I completely agree. So that said, I don't think it will cause a major ripple because I believe it was Sherelle who also said that most people's minds, I think, are pretty well solidified by now. And... Um, <sighs> I saw Trudeau this morning in a press conference, and while he seemed pleased about it, he wasn't <clears throat> gloating, and he is prone to gloating about things. So the fact that he's not making a huge issue of it, I think, anyway, that said, there was another point that you you and your panel were discussing earlier that caught my interest, too. <clears throat> in the event that um, the two leading parties end up in a virtual tie, which is how it is right now. Um, Mr. Shear is making the argument that by default, if he wins three more seats, the party with most seats gets first crack to form government. And as you pointed out, Mark, yourself, I realize, uh, you know, I've got a master's in political science. I'm not bragging. I'm just saying I, I know and majoring in Canadian politics. So I have some knowledge in this area. Constitutionally, uh, the other side is right that if Mr. Trudeau could get the support from the House, period, no matter how it breaks down, he'd retain office. Um, The only way I can foresee Mr. Scheer having a legitimate argument based on people's perceptions of the legitimacy, sort of overuse a word, but of, uh, you know, of, of his government would be if he won a very substantial minority, such right. as 158 to 165 seats, say sure. just short of a majority. Yeah, then, and if he had a significantly higher share of the popular vote, let's say, than the, right, than the exactly. liberals. Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. and I mean, you never, I, I, at this point, I wouldn't put money on it. I think the odds are still 55-45 in terms of a liberal minority government. However, I, I have been wondering the last few days whether we may have a similar phen- phenomenon going on, especially in the GTA, the 905 area, which is so crucial, um, as what we saw in the last American election in terms of people when pollsters would ask them, um, they, the Trump supporters, many of them seemed inhibited about fully expressing, you know, their views. And that's why so many of us were caught with our pants down and surprised when Trump won. They, because they know the unpopularity of Doug Ford's government in Ontario. And I mean, so you think I there are some that, conservative voters who aren't admitting that they're going to vote conservative yeah, at this point? More or less. More or less. Okay. I think that the support for <clears throat> Sheer in Ontario could be substantially higher than um, okay, we'll what see. the polls are telling us. All right. Chris, thank you for your call. Let's go to Dennis in Prince George, British Columbia. Hello, Dennis. Hi, Mark. Hi. Well, I've, I was just looking at the news, and uh, half of most of Halifax is out of power, half of Manitoba, half of Quebec. How are we expecting to... Uh, drive electrical cars we can't even keep our electrical grid online uh, and maybe you guys could have a little discussion on that but I also have uh, a little issue with this Ann McClellan report there that Trudeau sanctioned there um, what you know with all her profound wisdom why couldn't she come up with the fact that the justice minister could be in the ruling party and the attorney general come out of the official opposition party 
then the attorney general wouldn't be catering to all the power that the prime minister puts on her. And uh, that that's worth a discussion, too. I haven't heard anybody talk about that idea. And also on this Obama thing, I, I think it's out of line, whether it's called foreign interference or just it's just not it's not uh, proper for him to do that and maybe he doesn't know justin trudeau but i've heard from a couple of police officers that said they they've charged people with obstruction of justice for less than what he's done in the last couple of years in the mark norman affair in the snc affair and may, you know maybe obama doesn't really know what's going on but i really don't think that he should be endorsing us to vote for a man that can stand up and lie and probably has done criminal things. We won't know because he won't ever open up cabinet confidence, but uh, it's just wrong for him without all the facts to know that, to say that. Okay, Dennis, thank you for your call. Agnes in Neilburg, Saskatchewan. Hello, Agnes. Thanks for taking my call. Thank you for calling. Um, I think it's wrong for Obama <clears throat> to be interfering in Canadian elections. Um, I know he interfered in the one in Israel, and there's a lot of interference in the states from other countries, and I think he's endorsing this interfering thing. And he has no business of even having an input in Canadian elections, as okay. far as I'm concerned. All right, Agnes, thank you. Uh, when we use this word interference, that's a that's a politically charged word right now. I think so. I think it is important to draw distinctions, and I, I respect all the people who don't think it was good for Barack Obama to tweet about Justin Trudeau. But there is a difference between interference, as in I'm going to express my opinion, I'm going to share it publicly, it's attached to my name, I'm doing it above board, and the kind of tactics that we've seen with foreign interference in American and other elections where they are uh, beneath the surface, where they are subversive, uh, malevolent. That, those are two different things. They, they both might be viewed as a form of interference, but one of them uh, is very honest and straightforward and above board, and the other is, is uh, well, frankly, illegal, right? Yeah, and Canadian law, you know, says that you're not allowed, like foreign parties aren't allowed to, you know, induce voters to uh, vote a certain way. And all of that comes with, you know, something being attached to it, whether it be money or some form of, of power being transferred. So, yeah, like you said, interference is a very mm. loaded word when we're using it, especially with the, what's going on in, in the United sure. States. But it is it is not illegal what's going on right now with Barack Obama's tweet. Yeah, he's just speaking publicly and and people may view that as a again as a form of interference but it's not the kind of interference that has touched off controversy elsewhere so let's take a call from joseph in winnipeg hello joseph joseph hi, hi go ahead i just wanted to uh, announce to the world it's just breaking news in the united states president trump has brokered a ceasefire between syria and turkey how about those news Okay. I just wanted to say that Obama has no business uh, in our politics, and that's a brightened, and anybody with a brain can see he's trying to help Trudeau. But uh, right now, Mr. Scheer is going to win a majority government. Okay. Joseph, thank you for your call. Robert in Windsor, Ontario. Hello, Robert. Hi. Nice for, thanks for taking my call. I am going to call, talk to you about three subjects. The first one is there is no balancing the budget in any party but the Conservatives. So I am saying these parties are borrowing from Peter to pay Paul. They are borrowing from our great-grandkids or grandkids to pay for our kids right now. So I think all the people in Canada should think about that. If they, have, if they intend having or having or have grand, great grandkids or, or later on too, that this is going to affect them badly if the deficit keeps going higher and higher. Okay. Now, regarding the Obama case, maybe you all don't agree that it's interference, but I do say it is interference because he has no right to influence the voters 
to vote for Trudeau. That's what he said. He endorsed him. And I could understand if he's a Canadian or American Canadian dual citizenship. I could understand that. He's speaking for his country. But he is nowhere a Canadian. He's just a plain American. And he shouldn't interfere in our politics. Let us make up our own mind. We don't need him to tell us what to do. And my last question is to all those people who believe in abortion. I'd like to ask them one question. Where would you be today if your mother had an abortion? Thank you. All right, thank you for your call. Angela is in Calgary. Hello, Angela. Hi, yeah. Angela. My, my question is, I do not believe in abortion, number one. We're not, uh, we cannot stop people to have an abortion, okay? But uh, if uh, the Prime Minister shouldn't say, oh, yes. Another thing, we cannot uh, stop the gay, but you shouldn't join a gay parade, like, you know, and the only thing, he, reason he does that to get a vote, you know, and uh, I do not agree with him. And we want to take over. God will. We want to change the climb. I, I don't speak 100% English. I'm uh, born and raised in Italy. I was 18 when I came here. And we have to change ourselves. We have to change our heart. We, to change the climb, we have to stop driving a car, no buses, no airplane, no furnace, and it won't be no pollution. We are too many people, and we have no choice. And we have to put this in the hand of God, because we overdo. And Trudeau, Alberta, it's done the drain. He say create a job. We don't have no job here. We have nothing. You start, we only got the oil, and the, even stop that. No, he okay. buy oil for Saudi Arabia, and our people go hungry. Downtown is like a ghost town. I have two sons who work with the oil. They know what they go through. Trudeau, he don't know, and I hope he don't win. All right, Angela, thank you for your call. Doug is in Toronto. Hello, Doug. How are you? Fine, thanks. I, I like your program very much. Thank you. About the Obama tweet, does this mean Obama is happy with black faces? Does this mean that Obama is happy when the government of Canada found Trudeau guilty, not once, but twice. And what I'm asking your TV station to do, because I think it's a great station, that you tweet Obama and ask him if anybody in Canada got a hold of him to come involved in our election. Okay, thank you for your call. Next up is uh, David in Rivers, Manitoba. Hello, David. David in Manitoba, hello. Um, well, Obama's just giving his opinion, you know, so everybody should just vote whoever they want to, you know, and that's not like China hacking in, like, computers and that. And I like to know how come no candidates brought up the unemployed because a lot of people who are unemployed across this country have been unemployed for years or decades. Somebody should be helping them. You know, I bet you they could fill all the positions out there that the newcomers we keep bringing over. Well, we should look after the Canadians who are struggling. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Paul in Moose Jaw, Saskatchewan. Hello, Paul. Hi, Mark. Hi. Um, yeah, I, was, I, was, I really liked your previous caller who said somebody should ask Obama uh, what he thinks of uh, brown face and black face. But I think the tweet itself is fair game because... Elections Canada said he wasn't paid to do it, so therefore it's fair game. Um, however, I think the, the big lesson here is it's just a further proof of how powerful the Liberal Party is, uh, the po political machine of the Liberal Party, and there's a reason why it's governed Canada for two-thirds of its history. It has uh, influences in, in the, the press and in polling companies and all throughout the uh, business world. And... Uh, and to see that they can get somebody like Obama, whether he was asked or not, uh, to, to come and do their, their work for him is, is a, a telling sign. And uh, I think it's also really telling that despite all the, the power they have and the machine that's working, that they're still struggling 
at around 30 percent to try and uh, crack into a position where they can win power and uh, I think it shows that uh, the, the people are quite fed up and and uh, a surprise could be happening on election night. Okay, thank you for your call. Let's take a look at what people have been saying on social media so far. Again, we are asking you today whether it was appropriate for Barack Obama to tweet an endorsement of Justin Trudeau. What do you think about that? Here's what people have been saying. No, the Liberals are now using it in their campaign, and so it is now foreign interference. Next person writes, I don't care one way or the other, but I do think it's hypocritical of Trudeau to paint Shear's dual citizenship as some sort of crime and then turn around and ask a former American president for an endorsement. <clears throat> of course not. Obama's endorsement of Trudeau is blatant ele election interference. The only bright side is that when he has done this in the past, the person he has endorsed loses. Sure, why not? He is a citizen now. He can do what he wants. He is also a friend to Trudeau, supporting his friend. No biggie. He is a private citizen who, because of his solid judgment, integrity, humanitarian, environmental, and youth priorities, will only endorse someone with very high standards and leadership on important issues. It is a compliment to Canada to have Obama as an ally. So, what do you think? If you have a comment, call us or send us an email, have your say at cpac.ca. If you are sharing your comments on social media, please use the hashtag CPACVote2019. Vicki in Calgary. Go ahead, Vicki. Hi, Mark, and hi to the panel as well. Um, commenting about Obama's uh, uh, endorsement of Trudeau, uh, I would agree that they have a relationship that I think transcends the time when they were in power at the same time. Um, they advance common goals. They seem to have similar ideals. They just me uh, recently met um, in Ottawa when Obama was do doing a tour um, through Canada and also when he's in that advancing his foundation. Um, he's also endorsed Macron and Merkel. And, um, you know, our leaders, our other conservative leaders, have also endorsed other people. Andrew Scheer spoke out in favor of Brexit and some of those UK leaders. Harper spoke out in favor of Trump and Modi. Um, so I think we're kind of doing a little bit of a double standard. Uh, yeah. Okay. Uh, so I don't regard it as foreign interference. I regard it as something that's a little more personal and something that's maybe more encouragement and answering a question about, you know, the last progressive leader of our largest trading partner and maybe biggest influence in the world and kind of what he thinks, uh, because I think we all know what the current U.S. leader thinks. All right. Thank you very much for your call, Vicky. Michael in Toronto. Hello, Michael. Yeah, hello, hello. I'm I'm a little nervous, so you'll have to. Oh, bear take your with time. Me. Yeah, um, I, I, you know the the comment I want to make. Oh, and and, and uh, by the way, I really enjoy your program and and, you. uh, and the panel as well. Uh, the comment I I want to make is um, uh, the uh, these people that are we're going to eventually elect. They're 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 the leaders. You know, they're they represent different views and so forth. But they're they're going to be leaders and and they're role models to the rest of us. And uh, what disturbs me is when I see any of the leaders attack the other leader. Uh, like there's over 33 million or more or something in, in uh, Canada, I'm, I'm, I don't know the exact numbers. And it, it's so difficult for any of us to try to uh, get along with each other. I mean, it's, it's human nature to uh, be different at times. So when these people that are going to be in power attack each other, I think it sends the wrong message to the rest of us that it is uh, appropriate uh, to attack with, to attack someone that you disagree with or is different and, and so forth. And uh, I think it, in the end, uh, hardens our positions against each other. And I think... Um, uh, you know, I think the leaders have to give some thought to this type sure. of position that they're in. That's a fair point. They're in very, yeah. they're in very powerful positions. Yeah. And we, the rest of us, watch them. I mean, we watch them. So anyway, that's, uh, that's what I've seen in, okay. in this election uh, division. Uh, and it's, uh, it, it's um, unfortunate. It's unfortunate. All right, Michael, thank so you. Other... Oh, sorry. 
I didn't realize you were going to keep going with another point. Thank you for your call, though, Michael. Richard from Ottawa. Yeah, hi. How are hi. you today? Good, thanks. Good, good. Um, in terms of uh, whether it's appropriate for uh, uh, Obama to, uh, to be involved, I think it's pretty obvious it's not appropriate. What really concerns me, and I've got to tell you, because uh, to, to see where I'm uh, coming from, I've been a liberal all my life. Um, been involved in the Liberals. I ran for the Liberals provincially. And I'm voting Conservative. And, and yet, you know, somehow McManus, uh, when he refers on television to his conservative tribe, and you're looking at it and you're saying to yourself, why would I be voting uh, conservative? And you're looking at it and you're saying, look, Wynne and Trudeau have taken us down the wrong path. I mean, you look at it and to say that the hands of Katie Purchase or you know, uh, Katie Telford and Butts aren't involved in this Obama uh, thing is, is then you live in a different world than I do. And unfortunately, I mean, Trudeau just has, I mean, the whole SNC lab on that. I mean, they're running the show in many, in many ways. And so you're looking at it and you're saying to yourself, it's been amateur hour in Ottawa. You're looking at it, Morno is about the only person that's got any substance. Uh, you know, you're looking at, at uh, you know, the foreign minister who's running two cabinet posts and so infuriated the, uh, the people in the U.S. with her, uh, you know, the way she's handled the, uh, the whole thing. First of all, with the, uh, with the whole wood, uh, you know, issue in, in terms of somehow implicating China in knowing that the U.S. is, is, is uh, you know, primarily going to be dealing with with China and the trade thing. It's just you look at it and you say to yourself, gee, what have we come to? Uh, you know, is there no discussion of substance, of policy, of, you know, never mind the, the, the you know, the, the negativeness in the, in the uh, you know, political discourse. I mean, it's, it's shameful. And this Obama thing is just one more example. You know, government by butts, Telford, and, and uh, purchase. You know. Okay, Richard, thank you very much for your call. Paulette in Cornerbrook, Newfoundland and Labrador. Hello, Paulette. Thank you for taking my call. Thank you for calling. As, as, a, pub, as a, a person from Newfoundland, I feel that throughout the years uh, we've been sold out by the Liberal Party. Uh, with our resources, we should be a rich uh, province right now, but We've been sold out on the Atlantic Accord, on our electricity from Churchill. Uh, other provinces are gaining from that. However, my main thing is I do not agree with Obama endorsing uh, Trudeau. I think Trudeau is shaking in his boots. I think the black face, brown face, has caused him to lose many, many votes. And I think he thought by bringing Obama on a board, he's looking for to pick up those last-minute votes. And I think he should have thought things through before this, and I think so should Obama. It makes me feel like uh, knowing the character of Trudeau at this point in time, it makes me wonder about Obama now. A and it's sad. It's sad because I really don't want to feel like that. But I do know how Trudeau has lied, has cheated us, has taken away things that we should be gaming now here in Newfoundland and I do not see a liberal party and I get so upset when I see how the votes turn out that here in Newfoundland that we cannot see how the liberals have have sold us out so many times and especially with the latest one our Atlantic Accord people smarten up out here on the East Coast look at Trudeau Acknowledge his lies. See what he's done. He's gone. He's created so much animosity amongst the provinces. And vote, but vote anything, but don't vote liberal. Thank you. Okay, Paulette, thank you for your call. I want to go back to something that a previous caller said about the tone of this campaign and the leaders attacking each other and how that turned him off and that he thought as leaders that they should be showing... Uh, better behavior. Uh, we've already heard the comment made by Justin Trudeau that this is the nastiest campaign in Canadian history, that the Conservatives are running the dirtiest campaign in Canadian history. 
Do you think this is actually worse than previous campaigns, Maura? What do you think? I don't know if I would say that it's worse than previous campaigns, um, but I'm absolutely sympathetic to that caller's point. I think it was a very good point, and I think it's an opinion that will be shared by uh, a large number of Canadians, um, probably to a certain extent in every election, but certainly in this election. I think there has been a lot of focus on um, there's been a lot of focus on attacks on the different leaders, certainly. There have been a lot of this election is sort of focused on um, different candidates getting turfed by their parties for having made um, objectionable social media posts in the past, which of course is fine. Um, but I think a lot of Canadians probably feel at this point that there hasn't been a sufficient focus on policy um, and that there's been a lot of focus on you know, for instance, Conservative leader Andrew Scheer targeting Trudeau by saying he's not as advertised, uh, he's entitled, he uh, is out of touch with Canadians. Uh, on the flip side, the Liberals have been attacking Scheer for the whole campaign over his views on abortion and uh, saying that, you know, he's just going to make cuts and he's not being honest about his personal opinions on these social issues. And some of that, I think, is that's legitimate. Um, to have those debates as part of a campaign, but I think probably a lot of Canadians at this point are feeling a bit exhausted with all those sort of interpersonal attacks and really just probably want to know what do these parties actually believe in and policy-wise what sets them apart. Right. Great points. Uh, you know, uh, in terms of where this stands against other campaigns, Marco, I would remind people of uh, 2015 and the television ads run about Justin Trudeau. I would remind people of some of the attack ads that have been run against previous Liberal leaders, uh, Stefan Dion and Michael Ignatieff. Uh, there were some familiar slogans like, he didn't come back for you and those kinds of things. Uh, there were some pretty uh, there was some pretty strong language used by Liberal campaigns in the past about Stephen Harper and how much Canada would change if he ever became Prime Minister. So I'm not sure that that this campaign itself is any different, but I wonder if the if if when you layer social media onto that, it amplifies some of that and and further polarizes the dialogue. And maybe that's not happening at the campaign level, but it's in it's that that sort of tone is enhanced on social media. Well, yeah, I think also, though, just in general, the tone on most social media channels is pretty, pretty dire, pretty aggressive, pretty negative. So I think what's really changed is that this is the way that most Canadians now inter interact with news. So you're, you're starting to funnel it through this very negative, divisive filter, and we're starting to say, oh, well, our campaign, this campaign rhetoric is so you know, nasty, things are getting so heated, but I don't think it's particularly unique to this campaign. It's just this is the prism, this is how we start viewing things from now on, is through Twitter, it's through Facebook, and the biggest voices always take over the conversation. So it's always the negative goes first, it's the most popular, it's what people are drawn to, and everything else gets kind of shunted to the side. So yeah, I think it's so, totally the social media effect amplifying this perception of how nasty and divisive yeah. this campaign actually is. Uh, the other thing that's going on that I think is noteworthy, we talked about the numbers earlier and how the various poll trackers tend to show the Liberals and the Conservatives now each around 31, 32, 33 uh, percent. Very few of them showing any party above one third of the votes. Um, and they're, both the Liberals and the Conservatives are down from the numbers they had at the start of the campaign. So uh, there's a strange dynamic going on, Sherelle, in this campaign where there, uh, there isn't one party dropping and another party rising among the two front runners. They're both dropping. Uh, we could have an election result on Monday where, for the first time in Canadian history, there isn't a single party that captures at least a third of the popular vote. That's never happened before in this country. Uh, and uh, and so that in itself sort of speaks to where the electorate is at, I think, on a certain level, that there are, uh, this election is as much a, about who you don't want as it is about who you want. Yeah, that's exactly it. I mean, speaking to the, the fact that it has been such a polarizing campaign, it's, it's a bit of a rejection from the electorate saying, you know what, we don't, we don't like this. We don't like any of this. We don't like any of you. And the more you keep it's kind of saying, you know, we're going to turn this car around. We don't, the more we hear about you sniping at each other, the less we're inclined to engage. And, you know, so there are, so we have seen, you know, the NDP rising as, as they kind of try to stay out of the fray a little and let the Liberals and the Conservatives battle it out and, and, and you know, take each other's knees out. And it's not something, I, I don't think it's something that, I mean, we live, we're, we're not in the States, we're not, you know, two-party system we have other options for people to choose from and they are using 
taking that opportunity to say, you know what, you guys want to fight it out like this, go ahead, we'll be over here doing something else and you guys can right. be nasty. Exactly how Jagmeet Singh framed it in one of the debates, right? Yeah. Um, Maura, is this election less about policy than other elections have been? I know it's always a combination of things. Voters uh, will consider who they like as a leader, they will consider their local candidates, they'll consider who's been in power and whether that party deserves to stay in power. Elections, especially when it's a one-term incumbent, are often a referendum on that party's performance. Uh, but, but policy is usually part of the mix. Has it been less so in this election? Have there not been as many kind of policy questions that divide the parties? I think that, I guess my impression of that is that this election, you haven't really seen any party putting forward sort of a bold new vision for Canada. Um, I think that's one of the things that differentiates this election so much from 2015. What you saw in 2015, obviously that was a very different situation. We'd had 10 years of the of, the, of a conservative government, um, but you had the liberals coming in to that election with all kinds of bold promises. Um, some of them were bolder than they could actually deliver on, as as we've seen in the last four years. But I mean, you had the liberals promising. Uh, big things around on the environment, on indigenous affairs, electoral reform, obviously, uh, cannabis legalization. I mean, there's sort of all of these sort of very bold, big promises. And that was obviously, those are the promises of a party that was, you know, in third place at the time. This is a very different situation now. But I think what you see in this election is all the parties are sort of talking about the same issues, they're talking about affordability, they're talking about climate change, but you don't have any party that is saying, we are gonna do things radically different from how they've been done before. Um, you know, any party that has a reasonable chance of becoming the government in any case. Um, it's a much more sort of safe campaign, I think, on that front, and less exciting, I think, as a result. And I think that's sort of what you're seeing in terms of Canadians' general apathy about both of the front runners in this campaign. Marco, a year ago, if someone had said, okay, uh, four days before the election, the Bloc Québécois is going to be rising with a chance to win 30 to 40 seats in the House of Commons, the NDP under Jagmeet Singh will be having a great campaign, and Justin Trudeau will be in trouble and in danger of losing uh, his hold on government. I think a lot of people would have been surprised by that. Uh, what do you think has happened in the intervening time that has driven all of this, these different outcomes? Well, maybe perhaps the worst year <laughs> in the Liberals' history. Um, it just seems that um, you know we we know that the the big headlines will come out will be the SNC Lavalin scandal, and then also of course the blackface brownface controversy. But I think one thing the Liberals perhaps you know or something that we don't give we're not giving that much oxygen to now that we're in an election campaign is just how that rise of uh, you know of resentment to this government that has been stoked in Western Canada has been so pronounced that if there's any part of the country that is motivated to vote, because, you know, I totally agree with both Sherelle and uh, Maura, that this isn't a particular motivated electorate, at least it doesn't appear to be, one that's kind of rejecting all the options, but out west, definitely not the case. They want Trudeau out. They see him as, or at least for the most part, they see him as responsible for a lot of the is economic issues that have been dominating that region or been plaguing that region, I should say. So I totally think that this has just been a horrendous year for this government, and maybe they got late, uh, maybe they, sorry, maybe they got um, a bit too comfortable that could be a, a, a reason, but it just seems there's so many self-inflicted wounds that they created this doubt in the minds of voters. And now people who perhaps, you know, would have voted liberal, you know, a year earlier are having severe doubts about whether or not Justin Trudeau is for real, whether this government really reflects their values and whether they can actually do as they've promised to, because this really undermines a lot of confidence. Yeah, I remember uh, Jean Chrétien used to say, under promise and over deliver. Uh, it's, it was difficult for Justin Trudeau to do that, given all the hype that surrounded him when he became prime minister and the dynamics around him as kind of a celebrity politician. Uh, but is he perhaps a, a victim of the fact that expectations were high after he came to office? Well, I don't. I wouldn't go so far to call him a victim. Is it? Uh, it would be a self-inflicted victimhood. He didn't turn down, you know, all the magazine covers and the photo shoots and everything like that. Like they placed those ex those high expectations yep. on themselves. He said he came in. He was like, "We're going to do politics differently." Obviously, things didn't quite work out that way. So I think that if anybody's to blame for those high expectations, it is the Liberal Party and Justin Trudeau himself. Yeah, but but now is he paying a price for it, basically? He is paying a price for it. Um, there are there are definite um, avenues that you, if you look back over the last few years, where you see he could have, he should have, he went one way and he 
clearly should have gone another. Um, and I think, yeah, he's going to, he's paying the price for that. We're seeing that in the polls. We're seeing that in the resentment that Marco just talked about. Um, we're seeing that in the fact that, you know, like Maura said, there are no big, bold policy initiatives in the platform this time around. Um, they're trying to play it safe because I think they learned, they learned that lesson. Yeah. All right. Let's take a few more calls. Esther is calling from Lucan, Ontario. Hello, Esther. Hey. Hi. Hi. Um, I would like to, to comment on um, Obama. I think that, uh, like, Obama should not be interfering in our elections. Justin Trudeau and Obama are, are very good friends. And I think that uh, he asked uh, Obama to come down hoping that that would help uh, encourage more votes towards his side. But um, I think it's going to backfire on him. Um, Obama said that he would fundamentally change uh, the United States of America, and that he did. And as far as I'm concerned, it was to the worst. Now, um, uh, I, I don't uh, agree with your, um, your uh, uh, panel there. I think what's happening is, is that uh, the devote is being divided, and uh, like the country is being divided. And uh, I think a lot of people um, see that Justin Trudeau is fundamentally changing Canada. And so uh, you're going to see that on Election Day, more and more people are going to vote conservative because it's not safe to vote for Justin Trudeau because he is uh, a U.N. supporter, and that U.N. is very corrupt. Okay. Thank you very much for your call, Esther. Dave is in Port Perry, Ontario. Hello, Dave. Hello. Hi, go ahead. Hello, Mark. I enjoy your show. Um, yesterday you had two ladies and a gentleman on for a panel, and today you have two more ladies on for a panel, and they were talked about Obama endorsing um, Trudeau. So I remembered my daughter did a project on the election five years ago, well, 2015, went back and looked up. Here's an interesting article. It says in this article, I won't read the whole article, we don't have time, but it says, Wayne Gretzky endorses Stephen Harper. Okay, and then the article starts out, hockey, great, Wayne Gretzky endorses Stephen Harper. Response from Justin Trudeau is, Nobody in the United States should be endorsing anybody in a Canadian election. I don't need anybody out of this country endorsing me. Now, all of a sudden, he gets an endorsement from a non-Canadian, by the way. Wayne Gretzky was a Canadian. A non-Canadian gets endorsed, and it's okay. I mean, I wonder what those ladies sitting on your panel wonder about. Here's a guy who has a Lavalin affair, treated women badly. Look what he did to that young lady in Whitby that won her first... Um, thing last year. All she says is he yelled and hollered at her, but she, when in a tight interview, she said she will not bring out exactly what he said till after the election. I wonder what he actually said to her. He's lied to the indigenous people, and now he's a hypocrite about um, endorsements. How could anybody want this man to be your prime minister? I, I don't understand that. Okay, Dave, thank you for your call. Stella in Brandon, Manitoba. Hello, Stella. Hello. Thank you for taking my call. Um, what I want to say about Obama's tweet is that it's a slap in the face for Canadians. Um, I don't think we need that type of interference. Um, if you read the tweet, the first sentence is very normal, like he's complimenting Trudeau. But when he ends, that is totally trying to, to, to force a vote on people, uh, like trying to tell Canadians how to vote. So to me, it is interference, and it shouldn't happen. I used to um, respect Obama very much, but um, I have noticed uh, a political side of him that I don't like at all. Thank you. Okay, thank you. John in Prince Edward Island. Hello, John. Go ahead, John. I don't see anything wrong with him endorsing him. Endorsing Trudeau. You don't see anything as wrong? As far as I can see, if the Conservatives phone in, they're running Trudeau down. <laughs> if the Liberals phone in, they, they think it's, it's great. I don't see any point in having us, having your uh, program on the way it is. And uh, 
the the fellow you get on their interview with the bear with the beard on, he seems to be conservative to me. The way he run Trudeau down. But anyway, that's all I got to say. Okay. Well, he's a journalist. He's not a member of any party. Uh, let's take a call from Mitchell, who is in uh, New Denmark, New Brunswick. Hello, Mitchell. Hi. Thanks for taking my call. Hi. Um, I I think that the timing of Obama making this statement uh, was pretty poor timing on his part, but I'm very suspicious of Trudeau, uh, especially when his first remark is that he did not make the call. Uh, he said this uh, after the SNC level affair uh, that no pressure came from the Prime Minister's office. We found that to be not true. I I would uh, agree that probably he didn't make the call to Obama, but he did orchestrate it. He is a drama teacher, and he's very good at this. But uh, he is not the real thing. And uh, um, if we disagree with anything, uh, we are the enemy. And uh, he doesn't speak for all Canadians. He doesn't speak for me. He doesn't speak for many of us. Uh, but uh, he just... Um, he just... Uh, takes it upon himself to be uh, judge and jury, and he's, he's wrong. He's wrong. Okay. And his denial, I don't believe it. He's many times, he, we found him to be lying, uh, and it, it's like him calling this a dirty campaign. You, can't, uh, you cannot accuse people of not believing in climate change unless something is expected to come back. Okay, thank you. Thank you for your call. Uh, just to be clear, I don't think he's technically denied making the request to Obama. He just hasn't answered that question, and he said nobody tells Barack Obama what to do or something to that effect. So uh, let's take a call from Darlene in Victoria, British Columbia. Hello, Darlene. Hello, how are you? Hi, good, thanks. <clears throat> thank you for taking my call. Go ahead. Um, I am... Um, 72, and I'm a mom, raised four children, a bunch of grandchildren, and and um, my goal has always been to raise good citizens um, with a sense of uprightness and higher mindedness, and um, and they, it's really difficult in our family discussions. <clears throat> what comes up is the kids don't know who to vote for; they don't know what they're voting for. I think the organizational system of uh, is draconian and it needs to be upgraded into uh, you know a higher level so we can all be functioning on a higher level and <clears throat> what we came up with was the idea of separating the vote for leadership so that we can actually grow what we believe are strong good leaders out of our youth uh, for leading our country and that vote for leadership is separate from the issues and the issues would then be designed through the political parties, and they would be voted on as referendum. And then the package of whatever gets voted in the issues is what the leaders put together as a, the business plan for the country, and they administer it. And that way you're voting your, the apples and the oranges. You know, you know what you're voting for. Because right now, it's it, I think... What we're seeing in the denigration of individuals and the issues is is they're all lumped together. And when somebody's voting, I think the majority of people find themselves with one foot in the boat and one foot in the dock, and they don't really know what they're voting for, or that part of them is part of this party, part of them is part of another party. And and um, I think that that is not a democracy. And I think okay. we need to reorganize because we're all subject to a dysfunctional organizational system, which is bringing everybody down. All right, Darlene, thank you for your call. Uh, just a quick final thought uh, from each of you. Uh, four days left in the campaign. What, what will you be watching over the final few days? I'll be watching to see if any party has uh, a final 
you know, card up their sleeve that they've been saving for mm. a time just like this when things are really close and they feel that need to push the vote a little, you know, they call it, I guess in the States, they call it an October surprise, so we'll see if we, if we right. get one here. Yeah. Marco? Um, I'm just curious about how those polls are going to break, see if voters are going to, um, you know, flock in bigger numbers to the NDP, the, uh, the bloc, or whether or not some of those, you know, who are, you know, uh, uh, who will return to the, to the liberals to kind of uh, beat down the conservatives. I don't think the conservatives have any natural party to kind of pick votes from at this stage. So if anything, I think the liberals might gain some support in the polls or it might uh, stay or, you know, turn out in greater numbers for the NDP and bloc and that will right. be kind of how this election plays out. So you're watching the progressive vote basically. Exactly. The conservative vote looks pretty, pretty solid but, mm -hmm. but not likely to grow or shrink. Uh, mm -hmm. But the progressive vote might be more fluid. And I think that will determine what right. our parliament looks like. Yeah. Maura? I'll be watching Quebec. Um, I think that's to me the most interesting part of the country right now. I mean that's where we've seen the most change in terms of the bloc's momentum. Um, I want to see if the bloc can keep that going for the last few days of the campaign. The Liberals are hoping that some of that bloc vote, some of that bloc support is soft and that people, if they start fearing a conservative government, will come back to the Liberals, will vote strategically. Um, so I'm interested to see whether they can bring some of that support back from the bloc. Um, but, uh, you know, I think Quebec is really going to decide a lot on election night, so I'll be watching that province. All right. Maura, Marco, Sherelle, thank you so much for being with us today. Thank, thank you. you. Thanks. Great to see you all. Now, in the second part of our program today, we have brought together a panel of young party members to talk about the future of politics in this country, and we want to hear from you as well. Do you think this campaign has resonated with young voters? Will millennials, who now form the largest block of voters in this country demographically, be inspired to turn out at the polls. What do you think? We'd love to hear from you at 1-877-296-2722. Or send us a comment online using the hashtag CPACVote2019. Let's take a closer look now at that young voting block and how they see this election. My name is Regan, I'm studying elementary education uh, and I'm from Fort McMurray, Alberta. My name is Madeline, I'm from Beaumont, Alberta and I'm studying a master's in human geography. My name is David Draper, I'm a third year political science student and I'm from Edmonton. Something I'm really interested in is uh, the national housing crisis, which is something that the previous government recognized and started to take steps toward, but I'm not really sure how um, other parties or even if we elect uh, the same government again, how they would continue on that issue, um, as I think it is something that's increasingly pressing, particularly in the major cities, but also something that goes underexplored in rural areas as well. I definitely think rural housing is not something that people really think about as often. Like It's just as big of a problem in a lot of smaller rural towns, and people just don't think of it as a rural problem. Something that I really care about, one of my big passions um, is LGBTQ youth. And in Canada, there isn't a single LGBTQ youth homeless shelter, despite LGBTQ youth making up 40% of the youth homeless population. Uh, so I would really like to see our future government doing something with that to ensure that these people who are vulnerable in a vulnerable situation have as much safety as possible. Canadian politicians for me aren't really taking strong stances. They're being very deferential and they're trying to play it uh, very safely. Um, and I don't think that's really going to cut it when we're seeing an increasing rise in extremism um, and very hateful behavior. I agree. Like it seems further and further that Canada is moving towards um, a two-party system. Even though we do have multiple parties, it's all very divisive as to who's voting for who because nobody is making these big decisions um, as to this is what I'm going to implement, this is the big change that I'm going to make. They're all very safe changes and choices, uh, which leads a lot of people astray in where they're going to vote. Yeah. I'm seeing a lot of like retail politics too where it's they go up, they come door to door, they say, hi, my name's this person, I'm from the Liberal Party, I'm from the Conservative Party, I'm from the NDP, and they just say, this is who I am, vote for this government. Yeah. And that's cool, you have the platform from the, the central party, but where's the big stances, where's the actual like, critique, where's, like, where are the, the individual MPs going to fit into it? I think also the whole very recent brown face, black face drama um, was definitely a reminder that ultimately 
these groups are very similar. When you start to pull back the layers and the bravado, they're actually kind of pushing very similar goals. Uh, the institution of government in Canada is the same, regardless of which political party is pushing it. I'd love to see some follow through. I know in the 2015 election, um, Justin Trudeau had promised a formal inquiry into missing and murdered Indigenous women, but they're still gone. He had also talked about making tuition free or even lessening it extremely, and that hasn't happened. I know as a university student, I was very stressed preparing for my first year. Um, there's a lot of times where these campaigns are definitely showboating and we're putting our faith into these people and they're not reciprocating it. When it comes to an election, we're not making a decision for four years. Every decision we make, every single vote that is cast, is going on to the future. It's affecting future generations. So when people say my vote doesn't count, that makes me so upset because there's thousands of people saying that and 20 years down the line, people are gonna be paying for it. Exactly. That is very interesting and I hope they vote. I hope the, uh, the millennials get out and vote because they haven't done it in the past. The number of voters who are coming out to vote is very, very small. Um, I think that if we can get more millennials out to vote, I think that they'd have a huge impact in uh, the results of the election. I think it had a huge effect on the last election. Um, I think Trudeau did a really good job of uh, appealing to millennials. Um, I think that's a bad thing overall because I don't like Trudeau. But um, I think millennial voters have a huge say in the election um, if they turn out and vote. Uh, so I think um, Andrew Scheer uh, needs to appeal a little bit more to uh, millennials. I'm, I'm not sure they're as committed to voting and to the democratic um, process. Um, so I think it's a big question mark. But we need them to vote. We need them to think really yeah, hard sure. about how yeah. and do it. They could have actually a big impact uh, as I think of the last election. I did not myself think that the Liberals would win, but I, when I talked to younger people, I saw that they would cover some issues that, that would be important to them, and I think that's why they had a big impact already in the last election. They are more uh, liberal, they are more, um, uh, I think, unite, united, they are more united than even older people, uh, I think, because they, they live here for the, all their lives. They. Uh, they want to create the, the future or the environment or the society that they want to, to do, uh, to, to live in. And this is their rights, you know. If you're struggling, whether you're 20 years old or 30 years old, because that is the millennial demographic now in terms of, you know, maybe you went to school, you're stug struggling with student debt, and you're struggling finding a job that's applicable to your skills in terms of actually meaningful wage and meaningful income, certain pla uh, certain policies and maybe different platforms will appeal to you? Oh, huge, huge. Um, they're connected way more than old guys like me. Okay? They're connected, I'm not. And uh, they're going to make a huge difference. I think whatever party is able to get them on their side, they're going to get in. In what year was the voting age lowered to 18 from 21? 1965, 1970, or 1975? I would go with 1975. I would say 70 or 65? Six, 65. 65, okay. 65. okay. 1965. 1970? 1975. 1970? It's 1970. Oh, yay! <laughs> You came all the way from Vancouver to Ottawa to answer that question. Yes, I did. Yeah, that's my sole reason for being here. <laughs> Prior to 1970, the voting age in Canada had been 21 since before Confederation. In 1970, a revised Canada Elections Act lowered the voting age and the eligible age of candidacy from 21 to 18 years. The first federal general election at which Canadians aged 18 to 20 could vote was in 1972. 
Hi, I'm Lyndon Crane, 19 years old, and this is going to be my first year I'm able to vote. Hi, I'm Gagneet, I'm 20 years old. Um, I am an international student here at the university, but that's why I'm not eligible to vote. But I'm still deeply concerned about the issues around the election this year, so I am trying my best to be involved. Hi, my name is Paramjot Gokia, I'm 20 years old, and just like Lyndon, uh, it'll be my first time voting in a Canadian federal election. The two young people here who are eligible to vote say they don't think they will because they don't trust any politician. I can't really decide on which party I'm, I'm for. How about you guys? Yeah, I think I do agree with Lyndon. The promises being made are too good to be true. I'm going into the voting day uh, with a level of uncertainty that I haven't had before. And I do think that there's going to be a large amount of youth vote influencing uh, how election goes this year. Right around a federal election time, they say a lot of blah and a lot of, oh, this is going to happen, and then it doesn't end up happening. If you make all these obligations, oh, we're going to have free dental care for ho household uh, income, $70,000 or less. I want to, that needs to be finalized. Or we're going to plant two billion trees for the Liberal government. That actually needs to happen. We're unable to really find out who, who we can actually trust. Just of, with the recent news, things that are coming up in the news, brown face, the mentions Andrew Shear talked about with LG, LGBTQ. It's upsetting that we're unable to decide on, you know, who, who's that one person, that one adult that we call an adult that we can actually uh, trust for the next four years. If it's about trust, I, we can talk about the many scandals that have come forward. I don't know if we can expect more from our federal leaders if all these scandals have been wrapped around them. I think that, for example, a conservative campaign has been vote for us because the liberals have done this and that, that have uh, put you at a level of disadvantage in terms of civilians. and. I don't think that's uh, reaching a level of concision we need as a populist, right? I don't think we're getting information out to the voters uh, besides the fact that one party did something wrong, one party did something that was ideological, ideologically different from what you believe in, and that's why you should vote for the other party. A lot of the party leaders are not uh, taking a firm stance on Bill 21 that bans people from uh, wearing any religious or cultural symbols at their workplace, which to me isn't is a blatantly discriminatory um, bill. With the growing pains of this bill, I mean, it's, it's, it's to their collective shame that they're not all putting forward a detailed stance on the bill. And it's also to their collective shame that they haven't been able to uh, rationalize what exactly the bill means. I mean, I think there was a poll done that uh, prov other provinces, for example, would support a similar type of legislation in their own province. And I think, I mean, if that's not something we should stand up against, I don't know what will be. And I don't necessarily think it's up to the courts to decide. Of course, logistically and legally it will be, but it's, it's our civic duty to discuss that bill, right? It's our civic duty to discuss what exactly that bill will mean for us. Uh, whether or not that bill will have a trickle-down effect from the public sector into the private sector. You see, you hear a lot about the, the MPs in our area when elections come, but where are they throughout the year? Um, very few you see actively in the public. Um, getting involved, engaging with the public. It's great uh, a lot of the MPs came on campus, but they weren't here throughout the, the rest of the year. It is time once again to have your say. Welcome back to the program. Thank you for joining us on CPAC. I'm Mark Sutcliffe in Ottawa. In this hour, we are joined by members of uh, various political parties who are all young voters. Our question to them and to you this hour has the campaign resonated with young voters? What do you think? Call us at 1-877-296-2722 or tweet us at CPAC underscore TV. You can also email us at haveyoursay at cpac.ca. Millennials, as I mentioned, are the largest voting bloc in the 2019 election. Typically, millennials are defined as being between 19 and 39 years old. And according to Abacus data, largely lean to the progressive side of the agenda. Their priorities are affordable housing, health care, jobs, and climate. And that same data tells us young people are very motivated to vote. Only 21% said they didn't intend to. We went out on the streets of Ottawa to ask you what will drive your vote on October 21st. Here's what people had to say. better direction of the government, 
Uh, I'd like to see uh, concentration on our climate change issues. Dealing with the climate change issues is, uh, is I think, most important. I think climate change is really the defining issue of our time and that's really what's important to me. So that will be why I vote and who I vote for. I would say what motivates me to vote is um, like I want change in like how our world is going now because I have decided not to have kids because I don't want them to grow up in a world where the climate is literally free falling and I, I just want it to be a better place so if I vote now and if something changes then maybe I can change the way my future is going to go. Yeah. So. yeah, similar things, voting for change. I have a voice, so why not use it? Yeah, especially like our generation, like a lot of like the stats say that like our generation isn't going out to vote and like why not use the voice that we have to like make change happen instead of just like saying yeah. it on the internet. To make sure that the proper person is in the uh, in the proper position, um, that the right person is selected, and that the decision will uh, make that uh, we don't have as many scandals or uh, matter of trust, that there's a lot of trustworthiness. Uh, someone that's going to help with jobs and economy and middle class, mostly and someone that I can feel like and believe. The environment, climate change, it's big. We can't get away from it, so uh, to me that's very important. I always vote, but this, this time this, this is important. Joining us for our discussion for the remainder of Have Your Say are Grant Michael Hardy from the University of Ottawa Greens, Rachel Campbell from the Carleton University Young Liberals, Matt Antoniti from the Carleton Campus Conservatives, and Charlene Herrera from the Carleton University New Democrats. Welcome to all of you. Thank you for being here. Thanks for having us. Thank you Looking much. forward to our discussion. So, Grant, what brings you to politics and, uh, and why do you support the Green Party? Um, well, obviously I, I am part of a political science degree when I got involved um, with the Greens on campus, um, but one of the biggest issues for me is um, my my younger family members, my younger cousins, potential children that my family members are going to have that are going to have to be brought up in the environment of the future, and we have to decide whether we make that environment safe and secure and f correct the issues that are facing us to down the line, or if we leave it and let it run amok with rampant climate change and the climate crisis. Okay. Rachel, how about you? Absolutely. So similarly, I'm also studying political science. Um, and in starting my degree, I wanted to get a hands-on um, experience. And so I was initially attracted to um, the Liberals because of their uh, LGBTQ plus policies um, and the achievements that they've made in that community. Um, and my decision has only been reaffirmed uh, since I started working with them three years ago. Um, I have seen progress made in every capacity from the economy to uh, women's rights to LGBTQ plus rights uh, to immigration to the environment. Um, all across the board I've only been uh, more and more impressed as well as um, with our members we've seen uh, the most hardworking, dedicated um, individuals that I am proud to be a part of their team. Okay, Matt? Absolutely. I think for myself um, actively engaging in politics is always something that I thought you know, we need young leaders on campus. We need young leaders uh, for the next generation of Canada. And for myself, I've always had conservative ideologies, but it was only in September last year that I wanted to get involved myself, uh, seeing the mess of the last four years that, you know, Justin Trudeau has put us through financially and with the numerous scandals that have happened. So I think for myself, um, it was uh, it was a no-brainer to get involved. If, if you're not getting involved, then who better uh, to do so? so I, uh, I thought it was, it was a great time to do it with the federal election happening in October. Okay, Charlene? Um, I'm involved with a lot of uh, community organizations in Ottawa right now. And a lot of the things, like I hear a lot of like personal stories of hardship and like suffering. And these are things that I also can relate to a personal level because I come from a very, uh, I come from a very hard background. And so I really, uh, I really see I like 
see sympathize. myself. I sympathize, yeah. not sympathize. Like, uh, like I see myself a lot, right. especially with the new, in in the uh, when they uh, the new Democratic Party released their own um, policies or commitments and the kind of the the huge right. diversity of people that they have in their slate. I, I see myself in them, and it drives me to like to get myself out from committee organizing to get actually get involved with the pol uh, democratic political process of being here in Canada and having to be able to have a say and ha actually drive it to meaning f to have my work actually have many meaning. Right. T tell me if you don't mind more a about your own background. Um, right now I'm a I'm an immigrant. I immigrated here uh, in 2015, just two months before the 2015 elections happened. So I actually saw the entire cycle, the, elect the entire 2015 election cycle, right. as someone who's just fresh out of the boat. But and, and I, I could see I didn't have much of a knowledge of what is happening, but I could see there was a lot of progressive voices, like the things that I could see. That I agree with, both even in in all the parties that I uh, that are in this uh, in the elections, but in the past four years, you know, the more and more I've learned more about Canada, the politics, and getting myself familiarized with everything that's around me, it's uh, I've become a little more jaded, I guess, mm. and um, and it, it drives me. It's it, and I realize that a lot of my my presence here is very politicized. Like as a like an immigrant and a, like a like a racialized person, it drove me to into politics right. because I wanted to fight for myself. I wanted to t to be, to be in a space where I need where there's not a lot of people like me in that space. So uh, you won't be voting in this election because you're not eligible to vote, right? Yes. Okay, but uh, will it be the first time voting in a federal election for each of you? Indeed. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Yes. And how do you feel about that? Um, I think for myself, um, it's it's really exciting. I mean, you get to perform our civic duty in going ahead and going to the ballots and deciding who the next Prime Minister of Canada is going to be. And I think that that really stems to the question of why I got involved. I got involved because looking at the last four years, we had leadership run under Justin Trudeau, in which um, we can talk about scandals and you know financial turmoil and. It's, this election is about who do you trust to leave more money in your pocket and let you get ahead. And I know where I stand. I think I'm with Andrew Scheer. Okay. Uh, I think we knew that already. <laughs> but yeah, that's okay. Uh, Rachel, uh, how do you feel about voting for the first time in a federal election? Uh, elated. I'm really excited. So I actually voted um, in the advanced polls, advanced right. advanced polls uh, with a special ballot. Um, and it was it was thrilling. It was really quite a pleasure. Um, my first time voting uh, in ever was in the 2018 election, um, and that was really exciting. I was working in with the Ontario the, election. Yes, yeah. exactly. Um, and I was working with the local candidate, and it's such an amazing way to um, have an impact locally and to really get engaged. Um, I know that I've really worked hard to mobilize youth vote, uh, regardless of who they're voting for, as I know that it's really important that our voices are heard, um, and that as young people we often do vote progressively, um, which is to the benefit of everyone. Right. Grant, for you? Uh, yeah, for sure. I think one of the most important things for me is just getting out to vote. I see so many people that are apathetic and they're cynical and they don't want to vote and they feel that their vote doesn't matter and I think one of the most important things and it's you know just just like Matt said it's um, it's our civic duty that I think we should get out and vote and I think the most important thing is to vote for who you believe in not just you know not not just follow the same old system of you know one party or the other I think um, regardless of electoral reform regardless of first past the post I think people should vote for who they resonate most with. Right. Now, uh, the, uh, the advanced polls obviously uh, showed an increase in voter turnout. There's always the question of whether or not young people are going to vote. Uh, in the past, there have been elections where voter turnout has been lower among the youngest eligible voters than it has been among older Canadians. Uh, so what are you hearing? I realize you're all politically connected and politically active, so maybe you're not an accurate sample of, of young people, but what are you hearing from your peers, uh, maybe people outside the political science program who are more likely to be engaged? Uh, are they interested in this election? Do they care about it, Grant? Uh, yeah, for sure. I mean, I come from a fairly rural environment where there's <clears throat> quite a few people who the most political they get is only every four years at the time of the election, um, and that's about the extent of their 
uh, political will or their political their want to go out and vote. Um, however, I'm seeing a lot of these people that I know from from high school, a lot of people from my community, they are much more energized going into this election and they're much more willing to get out and actually vote um, just because of um, how they feel about it, just how much high energy and how much is at stake during this election. Yeah. Uh, Rachel, how about you? Are you hearing uh, from young people that they are paying attention? Uh, the last election, of course, uh, there was a significant increase in young voting. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. So um, that trend, a lot of people credited that trend to Justin Trudeau actually running, um, him being a young face, a really exciting energy, um, but also putting forward really exciting policies that we have now seen enacted over the past four years. Um, we have seen a woman's right to choose be defended. We have seen uh, trans people be protected by federal legislation. We have seen marijuana be legalized, um, as well as a variety of other really progressive um, changes to our system. And I think youth are paying attention because they know that that is at risk and that if um, let's say a conservative government were to win, that that would be at risk. Yeah. Matt, what are you hearing from your peers? Well, uh, in terms of voter turnout, um, obviously we've had a record for amount of people going out to the advanced polls. In fact, over 4.7 million yeah. electors casted their votes. And in addition to that, we've seen an estimated 111,000 young votes uh, casted through the advanced ballots, an increase over the 70,000 in 2015. So. It's very positive, and I think uh, I can speak for everyone. Being on campus, we're seeing um, um, more people going out to vote because it's easier. There's there's more access, there's more information, and people like 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 we said, it's good to get your voices heard, and we want to make that happen as young young generation. Charlene, do you think we have heard enough in this election about issues that matter to young people? Have you, what do you think about that? I'm. Yeah, like the thing is, like I'm involved with like the communities right now are kind of frustrated because even they, they even this even with like political parties, they believe that they're not doing much, and a lot of the things they do is just symbolic, but not actually listening to those folks. So, so they have a lot of frustration, and they, you know, they engage. They're very surprisingly engaged, but only on a surface level, but not necessarily that dig digging deep down to actually knowing like the commitments or like any of the po of the political parties but th i guess that's the reason why we have to be out there and have a be a, be a presence out there and actually talk to them like you know, as a rep as representative re representatives of our parties we have to come out talk to them pull pull those voters because they, they, they tend to be like they, they very much tend to be uh, the undecided voters right. yeah yeah. Matt, uh, what do you think about that? Have there, what, what do you think is the most important issue to young people in this campaign? Um, I think there's a huge talk of affordability, but particular to, particularly to young people, it, it's the environment. And, you know, as a, as a conservative, I'm proud to say that we have the most comprehensive plan across all party platforms. We have a plan that makes industrial corporations who fail to reduce their greenhouse gases uh, pay into investments in green, techno in green technologies to reduce their emissions, um, giving an incentive to homeowners um, in the green home tax credit and then also additionally uh, by uh, uh, by ending raw sewage dumps into our oceans rivers and lakes quite frankly under the liberals um, it's still happening 1.6 billion liters of raw sewage was dumped into the St. Lawrence River in Montreal and that needs to be put to an end and conservatives uh, will do that nationwide. Rachel, what do you think is the most important issue for young voters? Uh, I agree that it is the environment. I do, however, do not agree that young people see the conservatives as a possible um, a, like option mm -hmm. for a green choice. Um, I think that the fact that their plan uh, lacks targets um, and feasibility as well as ambition um, is a real problem for young voters. Um, I think they've also, they can trust that the Liberal government, um, we've done we've done work on the environment. We are the most progressive um, on the environment uh, government in Canadian history and we have, you know, innovative plans to enact um, single ban use on plastic as well as a variety of other measures that people are really excited about. Um, and youth understand that there is a very limited time to uh, help our planet and we have 10 years less in Canada um, and that they don't have time to um, vote for a government that's not going to take it seriously. Grant, let me guess. <laughs> I am going to have to agree that environment is one of the big issues, obviously. Yeah. However, I do, again, disagree that the for most of these young Canadians that um, that the Conservatives are have the best plan. I am obviously coming from a green standpoint, I do have to um, talk about the fact that the Greens have the most comprehensive and the most thorough um, 
plan for dealing with the environment. We've actually, you know, we have our name for it. We call it Mission Impossible, and it's the only plan that actually currently plans to meet the um, number given to us by the UN, given to us by the Paris Accords, trying to keep um, greenhouse emissions down enough to actually reduce um, global warming below the 1.5 degree warming mark. So I know, I know you're all part of campus uh, clubs and you're advocating on behalf of your parties, but I want to steer this a little bit away from the sort of partisan lens and just ask you generally, I, th I think there there is a perception among uh, people who are not millennials that young people will care more about the environment and climate change and, and, that, and those kinds of issues because uh, you're going to be around longer. Um, but I understand as well from polling data and from other analysis that's been done that the economy also matters, of course, to young people because you want to graduate from university and get jobs. Mm -hmm. So uh, tell me more about kind of that, the potential for a conflict between those issues and the balance between those issues from your perspective and from in terms of what you've been hearing from your peers. Grant? Yeah, of course. I mean, going into the future, like with housing prices constantly on the rise, especially in Toronto and Vancouver, um, eventually I believe that there will be, uh, in, unless we take action now, there will be an affordability crisis for a lot of young folks. I mean, it's already being projected that most people our age, most millennials, will never actually be able to afford a house. Um, and on top of that, you know, trying to um, transition to a green economy trying to transition to reducing our carbon uh, emissions that does take an effect on our economy and we need to try and take steps in order to keep us from going into a recession trying to keep jobs up trying to keep wages up to keep up with inflation so that when these young people graduate from university or if they graduate from high school and go directly into the workforce that they can actually afford um, to live a lifestyle that we are accustomed to here in Canada yeah Rachel what do you think about that yeah, absolutely. I think um, you know, a wonderful trait of young people is that they're optimistic. Um, and I think that when you see youth talking about the environment as well as employment, um, you see a possibility where that exists cohesively and uh, collectively. Um, so you see this when you know, young people are talking about getting jobs uh, and working for environmental organizations or lobbyist groups. Um, I think very much for young people, it, the economy and the environment um, exist uh, harmoniously together very well. Matt? Yeah, and as uh, young people look to the environment uh, for the future, the same can be said about Canada's finances. And um, it, the saying goes, today's deficits are tomorrow's tax hikes. And it's clear that, you know, while the Liberals have imposed a carbon tax, it's uh, simply a tax plan and not an environment plan. But the Conservatives are looking, and what we've been hearing from people is that uh, people are struggling to get by, let alone get ahead. So the Conservatives want to axe the carbon tax. We want to provide a transit tax credit that would not only help Canadians, but students and save uh, $200 a year. They want to include a universal tax cut that will save all Canadians, including students, $440 a year. And that's the kind of direction we want to go to with Canada's finances. Charlene, what do you think about that sort of conflict between the environment and the economy and the and the views of young people on that I mean it's very interesting because we want to have a future yeah. and the thing is like if we get our degrees and there's no future uh, there, the, and everything's on fire it's it contradicts everything we do so like in the new, the new Democrats uh, platform we're planning to do taxing taxing the ultra rich like 20 million dollars and up which it's usually it's not it's people are mostly worried about how you know it's gonna attack like you know just middle middle class people worried that they're gonna be taxed bra uh, big but it's not really the, the the thing here but like when it comes to the the um, the affordability like it's you know the like green energy that does take a lot of money it, it, it's a lot of money and, and and getting that money is by going and gr getting uh, money from the, the rich and just taxing them and putting them in the um, yeah and using that money to like use public transit like using uh, affordable or even free public transit because forcing a household to get electric cars in to replace the current like oil and diesel gas cars can be really expensive and it's right. going to take a lot of money from a the normal middle class uh, family so that's my take 
Okay, we are going to get to your opinions uh, on the phone in just a moment, but I want to ask each of you about the tone of the campaign and how that affects the interest of young voters. What, what have you heard from other people about that? Uh, is, we've heard from some politicians and from some observers that this has been a nasty campaign. Does that matter to you? Does it matter to the people you talk to, Grant? Um, certainly. I, I'm of the opinion, like with this campaign, it's been, you know, smear after smear from one party to the other and it's just been mudslinging a lot and I think that definitely affects people's opinions going into the polls it affects people's opinions about just voting in general and I think a lot of this atmosphere of apathetic and cynical voters which has you know fortunately it seems to <coughs> dissipate a little bit with how how high of a voting percentage we've had with these early polls um, but with these um, I think it's just it, it's a large turn off for a lot of these people who you know they might want to get involved with politics they might want to express these opinions and then as soon as they express these opinions or they come out as you know they they support the NDP or they support the Greens and you know this past weekend obviously we had Thanksgiving you know awkward family political discussion at the table and you come out and you was there one a oh, little bit a little yeah. bit of one but you know you come out in support of the Greens or the NDP and uh, all of a sudden you're kind of hit with this back and forth mudslinging about mm. oh well you know this party this this party this and it's I think it just is negative for all parties involved. Rachel? Yeah I would say that um, students are less paying attention to kind of the tactics of the campaigns and more um, they are personally scared. People have come up to me on campus say I'm, I'm really scared if a conservative government is elected. Um, they've seen what a conservative government in Ontario looks like and they don't like it. Um, they understand that student issues, youth issues are not prioritizing those governments um, and that uh, it's really this election is a lot at stake um, and they understand that not only the um, youth issues but the, the time, uh, the timeliness of this and the need to, particularly again on climate change, we have this 10 year gap and if we spend the next four years um, debating if climate change is real or talking about um, if we can really reach these targets then we're wasting time. Okay, Matt? And uh, I believe that, you know, conservatives will always stand up for freedom of speech. And it's, it's by debating ideas that best policies will, will, will come from it. And the reality is in this election, Justin Trudeau has done everything uh, to not talk about his record the last four years. So conservatives are happy to do that. And the positive politics, sunny ways of the liberals that they're proposing isn't happening, is being smeared with other provincial premiers. So to suggest that it's just the conservatives uh, doing it, I would say is false, but um, ultimately at the end of the day, the conservatives do have a positive vision for Canada. Okay, Charlene? Yeah, just bouncing off like Grant, with like there's a lot, like I f in, in my side of the things, in like the New Democrat side, we have, we're like fired up because everything's like you know, there's a lot of skepticism between the liberals and the conservatives because it feels like it just feels like choosing the, between the two of them, and some people are s not seeing the difference between the two of them anymore. And it's, we wanted to remind voters that they're they're just not they're not the only two options here. There's the NDP and the Greens, and there are far more different parties out there that they could vote. And this. And it's just the idea. It's just fueling them and get, giving them the the courage to get out there and vote to vote to the party that they feel like they truly stand by. Like they feel like they have their like morals and like they, the, the the like the social and the moral standing of they st just stand by with them. You know. Okay. Well, let's see what people are saying on the phones. Matthew is in Fort Nelson, British Columbia. Hello, Matthew. Hi, Matthew. Bart? Yeah, go ahead. Yes, thank you very much for the opportunity and to your panel. Um, it's very important for the youth to get involved, and it's sad because Rick Mercer commented on this, is that politicians want the general population to be apathetic and not participate, and then they can get away with their games and the corporate sellouts. And we see that both in conservatives and liberal actions. And a quick reminder as far as uh, the Barack Obama endorsement, is that the Conservative Party was endorsed by the country of China, who even gave Andrew Scheer the name Combine. So there's issues there with the Conservatives being uh, not truthful, and they're being endorsed by Jason Kenney, um, just to balance the Obama comment. Um, with the youth and, and the future, it's, it's dangerous because the one student who, who commented about the decisions aren't just for four years, they're 20 years. We're seeing those implications from even 30 years ago with Mulroney and the sellout and then carried over by Harper. 
And I, I came up through um, as high school in the Jean Chrétien year, and we had a high school that was uh, strong in political studies and, and even ran a mock parliament, so we understood the Canadian procedure and, and how important it is to get involved. And so I, I'd encourage that with the youth. But an issue that's challenging them right now is, is the media and, and these video games, and, and that's distracting the brilliant minds of the youth. You know, and, and I think we're losing the scientists and the politicians and the artists and the, those, all those different types that create the society uh, to these distractions. Okay. Um, so okay. just to emphasize the importance of voting and, and, and the stewardship of our future, because the conservatives are very dangerous with the pipeline as well as the liberals. And the environment will feed us as well as kill us. And we're seeing a health epidemic. And, and people, conservatives, I'd okay, like Matthew, to Okay, Matthew, I'm going to jump in just because we want to get to other calls. Thank you. Denise is in Belleville, Ontario. Hello, Denise. Hello. Hi, go ahead. Uh, yes, hi. I was born back in the 50s. And back in the 60s, I can remember us going grocery shopping and bringing home stuff in paper bags. And... And Mama was always using the paper bags to reuse them for putting other things into them to put in the fridge. But with this Obama thing, we're not allowed to stick our nose into the United States uh, politics. They shouldn't be sticking their nose into our politics. And that's only fair. And okay. another reason why I think Trudeau got in, which I never voted for him, uh, because I, it was the legal the pot. To be honest with you, I believe that's the only reason why he got elected from coast to coast to coast. And for me being my age, I'll be 62 in a couple of in a couple of days. And back in the 70s, my dad said to me, and he was working for the Canadian Forces at the time. He says, "Do you think we could afford this house?" today if I hadn't been born back when I was and bought the house when I did. And he looked at me and he said, no, we would not be living in the house because they were too expensive back in the 70s. Sure. And they keep going up. I yeah. don't even own a house. I could never afford one. I'm in a, and now I'm in a senior's building that's run by the government. And I still can't survive. And this is ridiculous. But I did vote for NDP at last Friday, and I hope the NDP party keeps their word on what they're going to do for us. Okay, Denise, thank you for your call. David in Kelowna, British Columbia. Hello, David. Good afternoon. Hi. I want to talk about the youth thing. Yeah. That was just brought up. Um, I hope they get involved. However, the environmental issues that are going on, okay, I'm not going to just blame the youth, but it's all of us because we have such a throwaway society, but I don't see people over 35 running out and buying new clothes and new cell phones every six months when the newest trend hits the street. Secondly, if I was the prime minister of this country, I would have instant free transportation, public transit, coast to coast, and we pay for it by not sending money to other countries like Trudeau has been doing, and my question about that is, did the other countries even get that money, or did any of it trickle back to his daddy's numbered account? You know, that's a question I have in my mind. Okay, and who's, is, sorry, whose I mean, father's numbered account? Pierre Elliott Trudeau has a numbered trust account. Look it up, it's available on the government website. Okay, well, Pierre Trudeau doesn't so, have any accounts anyway, anymore maybe, because he's maybe, not alive, so. Maybe, I don't know, but, uh, that's all I want to say, and that can be paid for, you know, by quit sending money to other countries. We can get a transit system across this country. Done. Okay. Uh, let's go to Isabel in Stratford, Ontario. Hello, Isabel. Hello there. Hi. Uh, thanks for, having, uh, for answering me. Um, I have a concern. I just wonder, a question that is, uh, how many Canadians would like to be called a liar that has been told on television? about other party, another party. Right. I think it's very um, ignorant to call anyone that or get have slander uh, when you're referring to another person. How is our young people going to uh, figure out which is the best way in life to live, to be rude and ignorant and bully? instead of being polite and courteous and caring. Uh, that is my concern. 
So I hope that some people will realize that, that that isn't the, the way to go in life. Thank you. So you don't like the tone of this campaign, basically. Is that what you're saying? That's what I'm saying, yes. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much for your call. Let's go next to uh, Benga in Brampton, Ontario. Hello, Benga. Hello. Thank you, Mark. Finally, I get the call. Um, hello? Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Uh, my contribution to the first is uh, about Obama. Yes. Um, it's, uh, it's okay that uh, Obama can, uh, for me, it's not anything bad here because I can see even the, um, um, the the U.S., most of the people go out to campaign for the other party in the like, uh, U.K. The head of a breast uh, party went to campaign for Trump. The ban of the uh, address uh, from Trump, he went to Italy. So all that is for the for the youth uh, for the attacking. The woman talk now is very good. The attacking is not good. That's uh, I I I I am with uh, Andusa before, but when he starting court to do name everything, he lost all the credibility. He was it's not good. So he will lose. He's going to lose this election. Thank you. Okay, thank you for your call, Danny in Rimby, Alberta. Hello, Danny. Hey, how are you? Good, thanks. How are you? Oh, not too bad. Um, I just wanted to say about the whole Obama thing, he should not have any influence whatsoever on Canadian politics. He is obviously a failed president. And we, well, I feel that um, the main aim with Obama is using Trudeau as a political puppet, which is quite obvious. And then the other thing is, being in Alberta, we get no help from the federal government right now. Trudeau does not care about Alberta. He doesn't care about the fact people are killing themselves, literally, because they have no work. Like, I have lost so many friends to them killing themselves because they don't have anything. But he is willing to break the law and become a criminal for 9,000 jobs when there is billions lost in Alberta? That doesn't make any sense. With him doing that, he should have been stripped of being a prime minister anyway. Okay, like, Danny, thank you very much for your call. And Nicholas is in St. Andrews, Ontario. Hello, Nicholas. Hi, thanks Hi. Uh, for taking my call. Um, I want to talk about Obama first, and then maybe, the, the if I get time, the state of politics in Canada. Sure. Um, the, I think the Obama in, uh, intervent tweet was uh, totally inappropriate, and uh, what makes it what's more disturbing is the fact that um, when Justin Trudeau was uh, approached with it by the journalist, he sidestepped any response to that to um, to whether he or his team contacted Obama. Which um, the disturbing part of that, I think, is the fact that he's acknowledging that they did. And but Obama, he's a, he's still he's Obama is still a giant in international politics and very influential, and I think he should have known better rather than to actually um, tweet that, um, because all it needs to take is one person's vote to be swayed to the Liberals uh, because of that tweet for it to be interference in my book. Um, so that that's my okay. take on the Obama. Okay. Quick, quick thought on uh, the state of politics today, then. Oh, I, we've already lost him. All right. Let's get uh, some final thoughts from each of you on uh, where, what you want to see happen in, in uh, the next few years in, uh, with a, a new government that's going to be elected on Monday. We don't know what it's going to look like. But, Grant, uh, what are your hopes for the next term of Parliament? Um, my hopes, I think, is just taking a slightly less partisan path where we actually work together collectively as a government. Um, because, you know, if you use the analogy of a ship, you know, we're all on the ship, and if, you know, we have one, one half of the crew going one way and the other half of the crew going the other way, you're going to eventually just sink, right? I think everyone should work together collectively, regardless of difference of opinion, and, you know, come to a comprehensive compromise that can at least, at the very least, help Canadians work through the issues that we will come to face in a few years. Okay. Rachel? Mm -hmm. I also, uh, I think I want to see... Um, people address political hostility and the danger that that 
does to our democracy. Um, we've seen uh, Trudeau had to wear a, um, a bulletproof vest in Mississauga, which was an unprecedented tactic. Um, and I think we've, you know, we've also seen um, other forms of hostility during this election. I've also experienced hostility personally at doors on campus. Um, so I think it's really important that going forward, whether you know, no matter which government's elected, um, everyone has respect for each other, um, and political parties address this issue. Okay, Matt. I think it's uh, really important that uh, the next four years we have a government that understands Canadian values and understands that you know Canadians are working hard but they're not getting by so uh, well, ultimately we need a government that lives within its means, uh, leaves more money in people's pockets and lets Canadians get ahead. Okay, Charlene? I think the number one thing is making sure that there's some form of immediate action like I know like a, lo a lot of things are can't be implemented in, in the four years a government's installed in power but some, some of the people the many of the people are getting tired of waiting and they wanted to see some form of change like even if it's just a small small if small ch bits of changes it's just a show that we're progressing somewhere potentially in a better and brighter future okay I want to thank you all for being part of our panel today best of luck in the rest of the campaign thank you for getting engaged and uh, look forward to seeing uh, you again in the future as uh, as the leaders of our future. Thank you for being here. Thank Thanks you. for having Thanks us. For having us okay, <laughs> and thank you at home for watching. We appreciate you joining us. We appreciate the phone calls, the emails, the tweets, the comments on Facebook. Keep them coming. We try to get to as many as we can on every edition of Have Your Say. We'll see you again tomorrow at two o'clock Eastern. Thanks again for watching. On election day, we want to hear from you. We'll take your phone calls and social media comments all day long as Canadians head to the polls to choose their next government. CPAC journalists, political observers, experts will discuss the issues, the expectations, and the key writings. And at seven o'clock, we'll watch the numbers roll in from across the country and get the story behind the results. On October 21st, cast your vote, speak your mind, and watch CPAC to get the complete results. I'm Emiliana Titarenko, and I'm a student at Manalsing University in Sackville, New Brunswick. I will vote because I can vote. Voting is a huge privilege that not many across the world or even our nation get to actually do. A lot of students on our campus, it was their first time voting. It was really nice to be there to encourage them. We were able to talk about the apathy, but also empower them. We were there to make sure that they know where to go when to go and how to vote. This year New Brunswick had a first minority government since 1920 and in our riding for example the vote difference was 11. Clearly our voices mattered at the end of the day. For the complete story, CPAC for the record.